few thoughts about uh about Purim so they say that uh if, if you notice Purim uh and Yom Kippur Purim and Kippurim are very similar in uh in their names and uh there's a, a teaching that says a Hasidic teaching that says that Yom Kippurim Yom Kippur is actually saying that it's like it's Kippurim it's almost like Purim um and there, there's a lot of deep uh Meaning so that if you thought that Yom Kippur was like a really special day, holy then, day. then it's it's only almost like how holy Purim is. Not that we're uh, we're having here competitions between the different holidays, but there are those who say. Um, and I think that it's really interesting if you kind of examine the differences and the similarities between these two very, very holy days. Um, where on Yom Kippur, what we do is we basically kind of like detach from the physical world for a day and kind of uh you know pretend to be like angels and just spend all day praying and we don't eat and we don't drink then uh then on Purim we really experience the total opposite where we kind of dive into this world uh head first you know with a big meal and, and food and drinking and uh and celebrating and dancing and music and whatnot and uh and we find the holiness here, right here, around us, amongst us. And for me, that's one of the most powerful messages of Purim, which is that Hashem and it, godliness and, and holiness is, is right here, like right in front of us all the time. And Purim really teaches us to, to kind of open our eyes and unmask the world uh, from this concealment that, uh, that we're used to, to experiencing. We're used to walking around and, you know, you see nature and we don't always see what's beyond. We see things happening and we don't always understand the reasons for them or, or the hidden meaning. Uh, we don't always feel like we're living in this in this grand master plan. Uh, but Purim kind of comes and surprises us in that sense that you read the story of the Megillah and God's name isn't mentioned even once, but somehow all the tiny pieces you know, fit together and everything leads to the other. And in the end, it, it just creates this big masterpiece uh, where, where you just feel the, that there's some kind of greater plan behind it, that there's some kind of holiness, even, even when it's hidden, even when it just seems super simple and plain and natural. And, uh, and I think that's what Purim is here to remind us, that uh, the, the, the things that seem mundane throughout the whole year, you know, just sitting and being together and singing and, and eating and drinking are actually, there's deep, deep holiness within that. And you don't have to go far uh, up to the sky, up to the heavens, to the angels, to experience holiness. But it's really just right here around us if we just open our eyes and realize that uh, that there's a mask on this world, but underneath it, there is holiness in every single moment. So, uh, so for me, that's a very powerful reminder. And we'll, maybe we'll just we'll, we'll throw in one more Purim tune before we uh, we head to our amazing speakers that we have uh, lined up for tonight. Thank you, amazing speaker. <laughs> Thanks, Yoni. Shoshanat Yaakov Ha'avesamecham Birot on Yachat Chelet Mordechai Shoshanat Yaakov Ha'avesamecham Birot on Yachat Chelet Mordechai Tshuatam Arita Netzach Tikvatam Sasonica, the 
sazón de hija. Thank you. So we are excited to uh, present Benji Lovett, uh, who since making Aliyah in 2006, uh, the comedian Benji Lovett has performed for audiences all around the world. His perspectives have been featured on Israeli television and radio and in outlets such as USA Today, Times Magazine, BBC Radio, The Atlantic, and The Times of Israel. So please welcome Benji Lovett for some amazing comedy. Thank you. Thank you, Yonina. Good evening. It is such an honor to be with all of you live from Masada. Uh, don't be fooled, this is a virtual background of a dirty kitchen. But welcome to everyone watching from all over the world. Uh, for many of you, this is probably your first comedy show online. And I know it's weird. The communication's one way. I'll be lucky to see you smile. I get very little positive feedback. Reminds me of my childhood, actually. Yeah, I, I shouldn't make fun of my mother because my checks are sent to her house in the States. I'm in Israel and uh, hey, what a year it's been. I feel like this is the year where the world has learned what we Jews have known forever, that it's better to laugh than to cry, right? And there's been a lot of reasons to both this year. Right, I, I'm an American in Israel, okay? I was in the States a year ago doing comedy shows. I had to cancel my tour, come back here as fast as I could, and the minute I landed at Ben Gurion Airport, security looked at me and said, from now on, you must keep a distance of two meters. And all I could think was, oh my God, now I have to learn the metric system. I knew I shouldn't have made Aliyah. It's a year now, can we stop calling this the new normal? In the news, in America, everyone's talking about the new normal. Get used to the new normal. Really? The new normal? I'm watching Netflix till three in the morning. I'm eating Ben and Jerry's out of the container. I'm 46 and single. It feels like the old normal, doesn't it? New normal, old normal, not a lot of difference. But hey, what do we say? When every door closes, another one opens, hey? We figured out how to do a lot of good things this year. I know it's been a while since Pesach. I don't know if any of you did a Seder by Zoom like I did with my family. And I know I can't ask you, but it, did you like the Zoom Seder? Guys, did you like it? I'm not gonna say I liked my Zoom Seder. I'm gonna say I loved my Zoom Seder. Yeah, you see the Zoom Seder is great for the person who wants to feel Jewish, but likes going to sleep before three o'clock in the morning. Oh yeah, mama, I wanna read the whole Haggadah, but I only have the free account, 40 minutes max. You know, if you wanted me to afford the pro account, you should have sent me to Jewish day school for good education. I, I've done, I don't know how many Chagim I've done online. A, a lot of my, uh, you know, a lot of my friends are rabbis and they're doing tefillot streaming online. I don't know if you guys watch streaming to Philoed. But if you do, here's my advice. Don't watch it on your television, right? Because if you watch it on TV, the first time it's okay, but every time after that, it just feels like the most boring rerun you could ever watch. I'm like, Rabbi, mix it up. Give me a cliffhanger. I should be able to call my friends and be like, dude, did you see Shacharit this morning? It was unbelievable. Yet this week, they put the Shema after our Don Alam. Who saw that coming? You know, Yonina was talking about Yom Kippur, right? And every year during the Chagim, I think about 1973, right? When the Arab countries tried to take us by surprise by attacking on Yom Kippur. I felt like that was a bad decision because on Yom Kippur, I'm fasting. If I miss even one meal, I want to kill somebody. Why did they attack us on Purim? I'm pretty sure Israelis couldn't drive tanks drunk because they can't drive cars sober. Half a glass of Merlot, I can't get off the couch. I might fight in a war dressed as a nurse. 
But I would say, I got another minute before I wrap up. So the last thing I'm gonna say is the best part of this pandemic for me has been my new puppy. And oh, I love him, but it's, it's a lot of work. Right? This is my first puppy in Israel. I got a dog trainer. She's Benji, don't worry. It'll get, it's what gets easier. You just have to learn to speak his language. I'm like, speak his language? I can't even speak yours. I'm trying to train him in my Tel Aviv apartment. I'm watching YouTube videos. One video says, to teach him his name, go to the other side of your home and call him. I'm like, other side of my home? Where do you think I live? Other side of my home, I'm in the same room. Tell me dogs know how to stay because there's nowhere to go. I'm Benji Lovett. Chag Sameach. Thanks for tuning in, guys. Thank you. That was Thank great. Thank you, Benji. Really. We were talking about our hamsters. We have hamsters. We, we try to train I th- them, too. I think it would be very, very interesting to see how many people here got a new pet during COVID because it seems to be a, a fashionable trend. Um, and our hamsters have been keeping us busy, but they they definitely don't know their names yet. Um, I also want to say that we're loving um, seeing everyone's comments and just realizing like what a, what an amazing gathering we have here from really all around the world. Um, everyone with their own... Leave a note connection. So thank you so much for everyone for tuning in, and thank you Benji for giving us a. Just there's there you're right there there's been much to laugh about, much to cry about, but uh but laughing is so much better. So <laughs> thanks for that. Uh, next we'd love to call uh, on Gedalia Gurfein, uh, who has been wowing Leave Note Pat, Leave Note Hever for decades. He was born in the USA and he made Aliyah to Israel, where he became a very popular and influential teacher about Judaism, life, pre-life, and even the afterlife. He also served as a, watch this, rabbi. He worked in finance, TV and film, and Israel high, te- high tech sector. And he's been delighting Livnot Chevre and others around the world with his lively, humorous, and deep teachings. So we'd love to hear some uh, deep teachings from you, Gedalia. Hey, thank you very much. So <clears throat> I was asked to speak a little bit about the idea of drinking on Purim. And I want to start off uh, by correcting a myth. M- many people, like the Talmud included, ask the question as to where does the word Purim come from? And the classic answer, of course, is the Persian term Pur for the lottery. But I want to say maybe it's a little bit different because there's actually a commandment on Purim, thou shalt get smashed drunk. And so therefore, the holiday is called Purim because you have to just keep pouring them all day long. That's really what Purim's all about. And not only that, but when the Talmud talks, just in case you think, because there are many rabbis who kind of like tell, well, it doesn't really mean to get drunk. It just means to get a little buzzed. Obviously, they didn't go to Syracuse University like I did. There's no such thing as getting a little buzzed. It's not worth it. So... Therefore, the Gomorrah itself wants to let you know it's not the case. And it tells an amazing story of two Amaroyim who sit down to party on Purim. And they get so drunk. One of them, uh, for, unfortunately, like Yoram, who lived when the sword went through his head, he actually shechted Rebbe Zerah and killed him. And when he woke up in the morning, I guess with a splitting, literally, headache, he turned around and he said, oh, my gosh, look what I've done. I've I've killed my best friend. So, of course, what else do you do if you're in a moor and you kill your best friend? You bring him back to life. However, the Gemara says then, next year, he says again to Rabbi Zerah, well, that was unbelievable. One of the best parties I've ever had. Would you like to come over again? Mm, I don't think so, says Rabbi Zerah. Maybe you won't be so lucky on the pulling me back from the dead thing. So, you know, I guess he just left it that he was gratefully dead and had come back to life. Nonetheless, the question is, why are we getting drunk on Purim? There are many reasons. But one of the reasons is to remind us of how human we are. Because quite often as a human being, we really, really like to feel we're in control. We really like to think we've got it all down, buttoned down. We know what's happening. We know why this is that and why that's that and so on. And so sometimes we have to suddenly completely let go and let God. We have to realize that even when we think we know what we're doing, we we really don't know what's going on. And therefore, we have to reach the highest level of wisdom 
which is ad shelo yada, until you do not know. Because a true scholar who really learns Torah is a man or a woman who realizes that the more that they learn, rather than feeling how great they are by what they've learned, have instead come to the realization of yet how much more there is they don't know. So therefore, the more one learns, the more one has horizons that show them that really we know nothing. And so Purim is that time of letting go. And what I'd like to focus on a little bit in this tight window here is the idea of why we as Jews, when we get drunk, we say l'chaim. This is the classic example because <clears throat> you know many of us have probably had Irish Catholic friends as I did growing up. And you learn that when the first bottle's broken over somebody's head, it's gonna get really serious in the bar. But then you suddenly come to Jewish homes and you get drunk and not only is there no violence, but there's an excessive overflow of love. And suddenly all the things that maybe you really wanted to say and really wanted to feel, suddenly like it says, Nichnas yayen sod, the wine goes in and the secrets come out. So here's the secret to life and why it's associated with drinking. When our sages wanted to find a substitute for the name of Yudke Vavke, they chose one letter out of the Aleph Bet and they duplicated it twice, which is funny because they could have taken two letters, but instead they took the letter Yud and they repeated it so they had a Yud and a Yud. And these two letters, for some reason, if you write a Yud and a Yud, everybody knows you're really writing God's name of Yud and He and Vav and He. Why? Because a Yid and a Yid, when two Jews can come close together and fulfill v'yahavta l'recha komocha, to love each other as they truly love themselves, that is the manifestation of God's name in this world. And what are the bookends that allow this relationship of love to come together? So the outer two letters of the word chayim, of lechayim, to life, are chet and mem. Chet, mem, spells cham, which is warm. So when two Jews, in order to be able to come together, it has to have two functions. One, devorim shebelev, nichnasim belev. Words of the heart enter the heart. So they have to open their heart and allow there to be warmth between them. On the other hand, there has to be a wisdom. And if you take the same letters and you read them in the different, the opposite direction, it spells moach, which is the mind. So therefore there are two functions which are happening to bring people together. They love each other, they respect each other, and they share wisdom with each other, and they listen to each other. When they have the love and the wisdom, that pulls the two yuds together, and that creates life. And that's the real idea of being able to get ad shelo yada until you do not know anything, except for the fact that you know that God knows everything. And for that, we raise our cup on Purim, and we say l'chaim. Okay, that was the end. <laughs> Thank you, Gedalia. Um, wow, that's amazing. That's so deep. Honestly, it, it made me feel like uh, like drinking this Purim, but um, as, I don't know if you guys can see, but there's somebody in here who it would not do them uh, so well to get drunk <laughs> this Purim. <laughs> So they'll have to wait for a different year, but uh, but it's fine. I think uh, this little person has their own uh, Adeloyada, um, being beyond knowledge, pre-knowledge, which is uh, very deep in its own. But thank you for those uh, those awesome words of inspiration. I want to just explain uh, Yoni's disappearance here for a second. He's performing his uh, fatherly duties and checking on our sleeping children. So thank God for good fathers. Um, <laughs> and... Um, next up, we are calling upon some awesome music, which I'm very, very excited to be hearing. Um, we have with us here tonight Yehuda from the Moshav Band. Uh, personally, uh, Yoni and I just completely love the music of the Moshav Band uh, and really just grew up on it. The Moshav Band consists of Yehuda Salomon, who's an Israeli-American singer, songwriter, and chazan, and his former neighbor, David Swirsky. Yudo was born and raised in Mavomo Di'in, an Israeli moshav founded by the musician and spiritual leader Rabbi Shlomo Karlebach, uh, who we love talking about at Leave Note. 
Yehuda and David formed the Moshav Band in 1996. They're considered pioneers in the field of Jewish rock music. Yehuda is also the Chazan of the Happy Minion in Los Angeles, one of the largest Karlebach congregations in the world. So we'd love to hear some, uh, some great music from you. All right. <clears throat> you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, good. So um, I'm so honored to be part of this program with Leave Note. Um, you guys are inspiring people worldwide, and uh, I'm, I'm honored. And, uh, you know, I'm going to sing a song called um, World on Fire, which I wrote a few years back. And um, this song is all about the power of prayer and the power of coming together and uniting. Um, and then we always have the, and that we always have the chance to turn it around and start all over, which is really tshuva, you know, and um, in, in, uh, in, Pur- in Shushan, you know, the whole story of Purim was, it, it was looking so bad, our world was on fire. But um, when Esther stood up to the test and, um, and united everyone and everyone came together, um, that's when it all turned around. And uh, I'm going to sing you this song. Hey, oh, la, 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 la. Everybody got their heads in the clouds, heart beating like a train on the ground, high speed on the clock. Now I'm turn it around, start over. Epidemic of the world is fear. Try running, but we're all still here. You can't crawl nothing when you water with tears. Turn it around, start over. Can't win, can't lose. I need you. Can't breathe, can't move, can't live without you. The whole world's on fire. Flames are getting higher. We'll carry each other. Turn around and start all over. I can feel the danger when everyone's a stranger. We'll carry each other. Light a flame and start all over. Everybody got their hands in the pockets, lugged in, tied down to the socket. Three, two, one, blast off like a rocket. Turn it around, start over. The sickness in your heart is real. You know it takes some time to heal. A broken dream and a spinning wheel. Turn it around, start over. Can't win, can't lose. I need you. Can't breathe, can't move, can't live without you. The whole world's on fire. Flames are getting higher. We'll carry each other. Turn around and start all over. I can feel the danger when everyone's a stranger. We'll carry each other. Light a flame and start all over. Maybe we don't have to run for cover. I believe that we'll find each other. It's a miracle that we keep burning. Light the way, yeah, light the way. Can't win, can't lose, I need you. Can't breathe, can't move, can't live without you. Can't breathe, can't move, can't live without you. Can't breathe, can't move, can't. Whole world's on fire, flames are getting higher. We'll carry each other, turn around and start all over. I can feel the danger when everyone's a stranger. We'll carry each other, turn around and start all over. Whole world's on fire, flames are getting higher. We'll carry each other, turn around and start all over. I can feel the danger when everyone's a stranger. We'll carry each other, light a flame and start all over. Light the way, start all over, start all over. Light the way, start all over, start all over. Start all over, we can start all over. Start all over, start all over. Light the way and start all over. Yeah. Thank you guys. Thank you.
Good for him. Thank you, Uda. Woo! Um, as a kiff, what a treat. Thank you. Um, and such a perfect song for Purim. It's, uh, starting all over and coming together. And uh, yeah, amen. We, we need more of that, definitely. I feel like all this social distancing is a... Uh, How's my hair? <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back, Yoni. Um, yeah, with all the social distancing, we got to make sure that we don't become strangers to each other. And it just makes us uh, miss each other more and, uh, and give more uh, virtual hugs, uh, Shomer hugs, air hugs, whatever they are. But we need those hugs. Uh, we, we really do as people. So next up, we, uh, we're excited to have here Shira Weinberg Khan, um, who has been a big influence on Livnot Chevre since she did her national service as a Bat Shirut Lumi at Livnot in Tzfat. Woo! We love Benot Shirut. Uh, in the last two years, Shira gave a sudden halt to her law career and flew across the ocean from Israel to become an educator together with her husband, Rav Mati, at Princeton University. Cool. Wow. Why did she do this? Because meeting people and learning with them is far more interesting than writing legal opinions. That's amazing. Shira, we'd love to hear from you. We will. <laughs> We're building up the suspense here. <laughs> do we have Shira here with us tonight? I feel like those uh, those news those news. Here um, I am. Here I am. Oh yay! yay! Waiting made it so much try better. I'll in a second into why I why I couldn't unmute myself. So I'll just say it's a small world because you had a cast that just mentioned the happy minion. So actually, one of our closest students is the daughter of the fa- of the guy that founded the happy minion in L.A. David Sachs. So it's such a small world across the ocean. So yes, here we are in Princeton. And um, I want to touch a bit on the story of Megillat Esther, which is such a great story. Like, it's so easy to sell. There's a king, there's two queens, there's a murder plot of a single, in, of a king, there's a murder plot of a whole nation. It's really, like, just a great story that, like, soap operas can be write, written about, murder mysteries. And, but really what catches me every single year when it comes to the story of Esther is how quickly the story flips around. Right, it starts, there's a king, it seems like they're going one way. And then like, while you're listening to the story with, without noticing, suddenly everything flips around. And on a regular year, that's a great reminder on the fact that reality is unstable. Things aren't as they seem. You might think you'll be able to do one thing and then you won't be able to do it. That, you don't know, we see what's going on, but there's a lot going on there. And that really life is not such a stable reality. But this year, somehow, you know, after a year or so of COVID, I didn't quite feel that I needed a reminder that the world is not a stable place. I don't know about you. There's just so much instability. At, like, the, the truth is, I don't even know if tomorrow my kids will have school again. To plan ahead... For those that don't like planning ahead, this is a great year, right? Because once you're expected to plan ahead, you know, if you're going to plan ahead a wedding a year from now, you're crazy. Who can plan a year ahead from now? And suddenly this whole reality of instability became like a really every single day reality of my life, of our life, that you don't know what's going to be. You kind of hope and pray for the best, but you really, really don't know. So I look, come to Megillat Esther this year and I ask myself, okay, so when am I going to learn from the story of Esther? I do not need a reminder of how unstable reality is. So I looked into the story and there's really a lot that can be learned, but I want to focus just on a specific point. In the highlight or the turning point of the story, which you can argue there are many, but there's one point where Haman decided that he wants to kill all the Jews. Mordechai is out there crying for them. And he goes to Esther, the queen, and he says, you have to go and ask the king for our life. And she says, no, I can't. I wasn't invited. What's going to be? And then he says to her something amazing. He says to her, don't think that you can escape to the king's house from all the Jews. 
Now what's he telling her? Is he telling her, listen, we need you. If you don't come and save us, we're doomed. No, that's not what he's telling her because in the next sentence he says, don't worry. If you don't go, we'll be okay. Someone will take care of us. So what is he telling her? Why does he come and tell her, you have to go? I think that what Mordechai is telling Esther is that, listen, we all go through hard times in different scenarios in life. And it can be scary and pressuring. And what do you do? And the first thing that I want to say from Mordechai is that he's saying, don't worry, the world will be okay. The world will be okay. But the real question is you. Where will you be? What are the things that are your essential identity? Who do you want to be? Where do you want to go into? Because we will be okay. But who do you want to be, Esther? Do you want to be a part of the people? Do you want to be a part of this peoplehood? Or do you want to step out and be in the king's palace? Do you want to close yourself off and be scared of life? Or do you want to think what are the things that are most important to you? That you want to go and stand up for? Because we'll be okay. Really, we will be okay. But you, what do you want? And Esther hears this. And what does she do? She puts on her mask. She dresses up in royalty, and she goes to the king, and she reveals who she really is, that she is part of the Jewish people, and that she wants to stand up for them, not because they need her, but because she wants to be a part of those people. And coming to Purim this year, that's what I'm going with. There's so many hard things out there, and it could be overwhelming. So first of all, Mordechai's notion, the world will be okay. But Shira, what are the masks that you want to wear and take off? What do you want to be a part of? What are the things that are important to you to bring forward? Where do you want to be? Where, where do you want to go into? And I think that in this instability, at the end of the day, that's the one question that I'm taking from the story of Esther. Where is the places that I want to stand up to? What do I want to be a part of for myself? Where do I want to connect to my, to my people, to my inner self on all levels? Where do I want to step up? Again, to come back inside. I really wish to us all that we manage to put on the costumes that we choose just to take off the costumes that we don't want. That we manage to step in, in our most royal and profound way, like Esther does and connect to the things most important and sincere to us. And it's such an amazing opportunity to come here and connect like this from all over the world, or we're walking into this royalty of Purim together, just like Esther did. Chag Sameach. Thank you, Shira. That was so beautiful. I really, really connect to that idea. Mamash. Oh, I guess we both do. <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah. So so uh, so inspiring and so so powerful. So thank you for that. Next up, we have some uh, words of wisdom from Yoshua Rubin, who, which for decades has been teaching at Livnot, um, being an important presence with Livnot Chevra in Jerusalem and in Sfat. Yoshua is also a couples therapist. Which I think it's something very useful nowadays. COVID. <laughs> Hint, hint. Um, he's also a children's book author, uh, and he owns Kosher Summer Adventures, uh, which organizes nature vacations throughout the world. God, we could use one of those. Um, that sounds amazing. His claim to fame is that he has been married to the same woman for 34 years. Tell us your secrets. And uh, his children get along with each other. Tell, Whoa. Us, tell us more of your secrets. Um, actually, I have to say that from lockdown to lockdown, our children somehow learn how to how to survive without killing each other, and uh, it's been a very uh, impressive journey. Watching One of them, them runs faster than the other. <laughs> no, it's, just, it's been really impressive watching them grow, grow closer oh. through these hard times. They they don't really have a choice because they just socialize with each other. But uh, but yeah, having your children get along with each other is a very impressive thing. So uh, so thank you, Yoshua, and uh, we'd love to hear some wisdom from you. Cool. Yeah, you guys can hear me? Dee na 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 na
cassette that Leave Note made, and he played it so many times, he wore out the tape. You know how you know you love a nigun when you play it so many times that the tape isn't there anymore. All you have is a nigun. <laughs> So we're happy on Purim. Why are we happy on Purim? Okay. Imagine you're flying from LA to New York, but there's a problem and you land somewhere. <clears throat> Where can you land with there's no Jews? Okay, you land in Montana. <laughs> Montana. Population Jews, minus one. Anyway, they say, listen, it's going to be a while till we fix the airplane. So whatever, what can you do? So you're walking around. You're walking around. No one looks Jewish. No one smells Jewish. I mean, you meet a very nice woman. She gives you a flower. She invites you to the ashram. But besides from that, you know. Anyway, you go into the supermarket and uh, you want to buy something to eat, right? Okay, you buy whatever you buy. Then you go up to the uh, cashier. And you know what they see? The cashier, she's wearing a t-shirt. You know what it says on the t-shirt? Leave no to leave a note. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God, right? You know what happened? I'm not alone anymore. I'm not alone anymore. Give out, I'm in the middle of Montana, right? I'm not alone anymore. You know what that means? That means when Jews decide to wear their leave no t-shirt, when they decide to tell the world, I'm Jewish, you know what that means? I'm not alone anymore. There's one Jew and he's driving around Manhattan and he's playing all these nigunim, Steve Brown. Do you know why? Because he doesn't want to be alone anymore. It's like the deepest thing in the world. You know what the Megillah tells us? Ish UD There was one Jew. How did they know he was Jewish? You know how he knew he was Jewish? Because he looked Jewish. Because he dressed Jewish. Because he ate Jewish. Because he sang Jewish. You know, I want to bless everyone. You know what Purim's all about? I'm so happy I'm Jewish. I know it's not politically correct. I don't want to offend anyone. But I'm so happy. I'm so happy that I do Jewish. I'm so happy I eat Jewish. I'm so happy I sing Jewish. I want everyone tomorrow, especially on Purim, you should put on your Leave No T-shirts. You should sing your Nigunim. And you know what's gonna happen? You're gonna walk around the streets and you know what's gonna happen? You're gonna find another Jew. That Jew is a hidden Jew. That Jew is a little scared to be Jewish. So put on your T-shirts, sing your Nigunim, and suddenly, 
You're going to find all these hidden gems. I understand. How come you're not singing? Everyone has to sing with me. Start clapping your hands. Last Thank, Thank you, Yeshua. <laughs> Guarantee that that's going to be stuck in our heads. So uh, <laughs> thanks a lot. Um, in a good way. <laughs> thank you for that. Um, and uh, just to follow up, uh, to continue with our uh, lineup of, uh, of epic uh, Benot Sharut, our next speaker is uh, Shira Shorty Friedlander. Uh, who also did her national service at Livnot as a bachelorot. And uh, currently she's a medical clown in the Dream Doctors Project, working in Sharet Tzedek Hospital in Jerusalem and in a children's home for at-risk kids as a therapeutic clown. Wow. She is a mother, a wife, and an uh, unbelievably good-looking daughter. Uh, and uh, <laughs> a professional, annoying sister. <laughs> Shira claims, who wrote this bio? <laughs> Shira claims that she finishes most of the food on her plate and that she brushes her teeth an average of one and a half times a day. Which is okay. good. <laughs> That's great. Shira, um, please, Pur Purim is your time to shine. <laughs> what can I say after that uh, invitation? There's nothing left to say. Thank you for the good words. <laughs> Um, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Shira. You can call me Shorty. Um, and yes, I'm a medical clown. And I'll tell you the truth when I was thinking about what I'm going to say. Why am I a medical clown? The honest truth is because I'm a drama queen. That's what it is. I was a drama queen all the time in high school and elementary school. It's what got me through school. <laughs> I hated school. That's how I got through it, I think. Um, and because I'm short. And as a short per person, you just need to grab attention in every way that you can. And that's what I did. Or let me say it differently. That's what clowning did to me. It made me, how do I say it? It empowered me to be the clown in class. It empowered me to make people laugh. It empowered me to be this person that I am today. And then I found medical clowning and I said, you know what? That's what I wanna do. And that's what medical clowning is about. You we try to empower the kids in hospital to be who they really are. From a strong belief, and I feel like I'm very serious now, even though I'm wearing my red nose, but we try to make the kids stronger from inside so they can help body and soul get healthy, get better, feel stronger. Um, we try to see the child not from the sick point of view, not from when when we come into the hospital, we just become numbers, figures, our ID number. We have the same uniform. We wear what the hospital gives us. We try, we lose something. We lose this, who we are. 
And then the clown comes in and tries to know who you are, who this child, what's his name, what do you like to do? And not only for kids, also the adults, the people, the parents around them. And we all know how much we as parents, how we affect our kids when they just see how we're feeling, if we're nervous, um, if we're scared, how much it affects them. And then that's what the child will feel. Even though we're trying to be as calm as we can, a blood test is a blood test and it's scary and it's a needle and it's painful. So when the clown tries to come in and either distract the child or try to just be playful, and you can't really ignore a person that comes in dressed all colorful, wearing a hat or something and a red nose, that if you think about it, the red nose is the smallest mask that you can put on your face. And it's been, I don't know the exact years, sorry, um, but it's been around forever. It comes from the history from the person that's always drunk, and always has this red nose and always falls and falls and falls on face and everyone just ex enjoys laughing at that person and that's what the clown is he's not about succeeding well he is he wants to succeed he wants to be normal he wants to be in the path that everyone's trying to go he wants to be that person that will be the best in class and will jump the highest and be the first at everything but he keeps falling and he keeps failing and clowning is about that is watching the person fall down but getting up again fall down again but getting up again and that's something that I really connect to because it happens to all of us and there's even something more unique about each one of us on the way we fail because we all fail differently we all fall different in our own way and that's when the honest person that's inside of us comes out we're not trying to cover it I mean we are trying to cover our failure but we're not trying to hide who we are because we can't when we fall it's our real person and the clown is bringing that feeling of um, naive or honesty or this child that just can't hide this emotion inside anymore. And when we bring this energy to the hospital, we're trying also to let those emotions come out. Even if you're angry and even if you're upset, bring it out. Bring everything out because it's better out than in. It's always just good to, you know what, you're upset, bring it out. Let's be upset together. Um, I'll tell you a story from the hospital. When I was just dressing up and coming out of my room, uh, of the clown room and putting on my red nose and I see this father and child, like a three-year-old sitting next to each other and the three-year-old was so quiet and the father was so distant from him. And I see we had some eye contact, me and the little child. So I started uh, talking to him and we're starting to play. And the father is very distant. He's not, I, I, I'm not understanding what's going on there with the father. He's just not present. But I'm playing with the child and the child's playing with me. And then I feel a hand on my shoulder and I turn around. The father is just saying to me, thank you. And you can see in his eyes how much he really just needed someone there. Um. A few minutes later, I see the mother coming in and I realize that they just got a really bad news about the child, um, that the child is sick and the father just was waiting for the mother to come because he couldn't hold it in and he couldn't speak to the child or look at him. And sometimes the clown, or at least I was there just for that, to distract the child and for the father to know that someone is there to be with him. I wasn't even trying to be funny. I wasn't even trying to be... I don't know, a grab extra attention. I just had my red nose on me and the child saw that person that he could just connect to because his father wasn't there. And that's also medical clowning. It's not always about being funny. It's not always about pulling the best joke to make everybody crack up. It's just to be there with the hand on the shoulder or stand next to each other because it's a very big system out there of uh, hospitals and the clown tries to be wherever he can. Um, so as you said, I work at the Dream Doctor Project and for a while we work in uh, 30 hospitals in Israel and we try to also take it out of the hospital. We try to work also in uh, uh, schools that kids, boarding schools that kids can't go home anymore because they're at high risk at home or their families can't have them. And we try to bring some therapeutic clowning there. 
we also uh, have been sent around the world to be as at risk um, at disaster zones like Nepal in 2015 with a big earthquake there uh, and Haiti in 2010, if I'm not mistaken, um, Israel sent the clowns there as part of the field, uh, the hospital field school. If the hospital field medical um, hospital um, and we're also understanding that clowning has room in our society in many, many, many levels. And a lot of places need it and want it um, and want to get stronger through clowning, through something different, through something that can make us stronger and look at our life in a different way. Um, we like to say that we are, we call ourselves dream doctors, but we like to say that we are doctors of imagination and that the hospital is our big playground. And I have to say that when I look, when I come to the hospital, I try to not be Shira and I'm just shorty for a few hours just to bring that energy of playfulness to a hospital. So Chag Sameach, everybody. I hope you have a wonderful and meaningful Chag and, and stay healthy. Thank you. Thank you, Shira. I wish wow. you were there when I got my shot. It was very scary for me. Hey, our Corona vaccines. <laughs> but wow, kola kavod for the amazing work that you do. Uh, wow, guys, this hour has flown by, and we have our last speaker here with us uh, tonight, Michael Evan Esh, who uh, we would just we just love hearing anything you have to say, Michael. Seriously, <laughs> um, Michael is a teacher and outdoor educator at Livnot, which he considers his spiritual home. He also teaches tour guides. Um, I was one of them. Right? <laughs> and leads birthright groups. He lives with his family in the Golan Heights and can often be found in his pirate ship, Treehouse. Obviously, poor Mrs. favorite holiday. Michael, as our final speaker for tonight, we'd love to hear some uh, some wisdom from you. And here you go. Arr. There's some awkward silence going on right now. You're muted. <laughs> oh, welcome, Michal. Arr, arr, arr. Folks, there's a Jewish tradition that's been followed for centuries. Jews dress up and wear costumes on Purim. But not just kids, adults too. So what's the deal here? And while we're at it, is it okay to wear our pagan Halloween costumes on Purim also? So some people find hints of this tradition in the Megillah itself. Queen Esther hides her Jewishness. The name Esther even means hiding in Hebrew. And costumes and even clothes hide a person. Mordechai, Esther, Haman, and the king are all often described in detail by their clothes. So the theme of clothes definitely fits the book of Esther that we read on Purim. And this year, when we're all wearing masks anyway, that's even more true. But there are hints elsewhere, too. For instance, in Hebrew, the word for clothes comes from the same word for traitor, as if to say, clothes, of course, are important, but they do not mirror on the outside what's going on on the inside. One cannot deduce anything from a person's clothes as to what's going on in their soul. Clothes do not do justice to one's innards, and they are, as it were, Traitors. Now, that's not to say that a person who cares about their clothing is a traitor, but perhaps it means that if you want to truly know a person and you judge them by their clothes, you may be being a kind of traitor to their inner essence. Purim, of course, being the ultimate Jewish holiday, the sages said in the Midrash, one day all the Jewish holidays will be canceled, but Purim will stay forever. As if to say, this is the definitive. Jewish holiday. And if this is a holiday of holidays, then it is a day when we can truly celebrate our inner essence without having to hide anything. It's a day when we can let down our tortoise-like defense mechanisms and just be ourselves. But on Purim, we go one step further. We let out our beautiful inner essence and we let it be expressed on the outside. So what is often a traitor 
then becomes a double agent. On Purim, our clothes can reflect our kishkis. Yes, every human has beautiful kishkis. That's a metaphor. Every person has a beautiful inner essence. It's just that some folks don't know that they have that inside of them. And some folks don't know that you can let that flow outwards. And some folks don't know how to let their beautiful inner essence flow out. And most of all, the rest of us aren't always sharp enough to sense the beautiful inner essence of others that is trying with all its heart and all its soul, as if in battle, to get outside to the world and sing its song. So wearing a, a costume on Purim, we look at that in this fashion, it's a very serious thing. Okay, now, if the is true, then why would someone dress up, for instance, as a pirate? Like, what's beautiful about pirates? Besides, of course, having wooden legs and hookish hands and patched eyes, uh, these guys are robbers, cutthroats, and basic all-around meanies. The Purim, remember, is the classic inside-out, upside-down day. As the verse in the scroll of Esther says, V'nahafoch hu, Haman's entire genocidal plan for the Jews was turned around in an inside-out, upside-down fashion, as Judah sang. And if that is one of the themes of the day, then we folks have to read in reverse mirror writing when seeing people's costumes. When you see people dressing up as pirates or monsters or zombies or ghouls or dementors or witches, please use your v'nahafohu perm vision and understand that these are the nice guys. So yes, we may seem as if we like capturing other people's boats, stealing their gold pieces, or kidnapping their parrots, or those on whose shoulders there are parrots, but no, v'nahafohu. So the next time you see a poor pirate, hug them this year with your elbow. But please, don't forget your kishkis. In the end, the fiery hate of witchy Haman is extinguished by the watery, Dorothyish love of Esther for her people. We need to emulate Esther, who followed the Torah's yellow brick road and reached home sweet home, the Kansas-like redemption of the entire Jewish people. So on Purim, don't think water, don't think fire, think water, water. Hi, I'm melting. Hug some air. <laughs> Woo! Hi, Michael. Thank you for that. Thank you to everyone for joining I us. I have to tonight. say that, Michael, uh, if you're trying to be a scary pirate, you're just too nice. <laughs> 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 so my whole Mahafoko thing isn't working on you. <laughs> It is. It's 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 very confusing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but uh, anyways, so thank you so much to all of you for joining us from around the world tonight, um, and uh, for all these incredible speakers, and uh, and for all the great music and the wisdom, just helping us all connect to uh, to pour in a little bit more and connect to each other and start the celebrations a few days early, uh, which is always fun. Because why, why wait till Purim to experience the, the holiness of Purim? If we could start it right now. Just don't start drinking too early because that could be a little much. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> but we could start dressing up early. Um, and maybe we'll just finish off uh, with a final song before uh, we say goodbye to everyone. So, uh, on the theme of happiness. Here's a little song I wrote. You might want to sing it note for note. So don't worry. Happy. Don't worry, be happy. In our lives we have some trouble. If we worry, we make it double. Don't worry. Mm -hmm. Be happy. I want to see you all snapping with us. Yeah. 
opportunity to gather to gather to everyone who organizes behind the scenes in front of the scenes to all the visionaries to the awesome Benot Shirut, um, past and present yes to all the chevre and everybody who tuned in tonight um and thank you for uh for allowing us to tap into the leave note magic and to put on from afar our wig and giving us a reason to uh to start <laughs> getting dressed up a little bit earlier so Laila Tov, or uh, good morning, or wherever it is you are, to everyone, wishing you all a beautiful, meaningful, deep, holy, happy, unified Purim. May we uh, enjoy our costumes, putting on our masks, taking off our masks, and uh, just... Uh, Don't forget to see the inner, special people around you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, everyone, we're going to serenade you as you log out. Oh, and we'd love to see you all at the next uh, online Leave Note session for Pesach, so stay tuned. Yay, we get Leave Note all around the year. This is amazing. Can I continue? Yes. <laughs> Connecting this. <laughs> okay, now the drum roll. Are we roll. doing it? We're who's, doing who's it. Who's going to be the one to, well, to turn well, how off? About, how about this one? One. Uh, Yay, Aaron! One little leave note there. Leave note, uh, like. Uh, Deep inside my heart, I've got this everlasting, everlasting light is shining like the sun. It radiates on everyone, and the more that I live, the more I've got to give. It's the way that I live, it's what I'm living for. Deep inside my heart, I got this everlasting light is shining like the sun it radiates on everyone and the more that i give the more i got to give it's the way that i live it's what i'm living for as if you're drunk yeah, how do i do that <laughs> yeah. oh deep <laughs> Someone, i got this everlasting light is shining <laughs> For me, like the sun, it radiates on everyone. That's like an opera singer. And the more that I give, the, the more, more I got, got to, to give. It's the way that I live. It's what I'm living for. Okay, to anybody who hasn't left until now, you will be disconnected. You're sorry. We well, we'll, you all keep on sitting around in our seats and feel connected. Because <laughs> we won't see each other on the screen. Okay, so Purim Sameach, everybody. 